Welcome back. I'm Abby Williams and I am the Director of Impact Innovation Knowledge Exchange. I think those are all the words uh, at Torch. And so I work with uh, Vicky and Tasha and Ruth, who've been here today in developing knowledge exchange projects between academic researchers and external partners. And it's really exciting to start to see the fruits of some of those collaborations in the ways that colleagues have been talking this afternoon and to also hear from their external partners on what the kind of benefits and some of the challenges are in, in working together. What we're going to be doing in this final session is really turning to the experts in this sector to, a zone, to talk a bit more about um, a world which is not familiar to all of us, but uh, to open up the question of what the future might be for immersive technology in a kind of game environment, but also in a collaborative environment, and to get some of your insights into what's going on, what's exciting, the kind of work you have done. Um, and possible ways in for some of us. So we've just heard from Brian, um, who is formerly of Rebellion and of Audio Motion, and he introduced uh, Ed here, who is from Vicon. Um, Vicon is uh, a he is a leading is another motion capture company, also based locally. And the person you haven't heard from uh, is David Levy, who is director of business development at Ari who are a designer and manufacturer of camera and lighting solutions. So I don't know if, Ed, you want to just say a little bit to start with um, about your background and then on to David, and then we'll open up some bigger questions about um, the exciting things you think are going on and future directions. Sure. So I've been at Vicon for nine months. Feels like nine years, which is a good thing. I hasten to add because my boss hears everything I say, no matter how far away I am. Um, before this, I was at Staffordshire University uh, for five years, and while I was there, I kind of helped establish initially their motion capture lab, which is why I came into contact with Vicon, and then I moved on to laser scanning, photogrammetry, and basically any word that they thought had a game engine component to it became my problem, which was cool because you get to see all these different things and how they might sort of interface, but throughout that kind of whole uh, experience, game tech and visualization tech were kind of these black boxes that various other parts of the the university like the sound of but were also scared of so we kind of became this resource to not only help illuminate people's understanding of what these things meant but specifically how we could make those kind of work in their particular environments and i think that's kind of where our relevance comes in uh, with this stuff today um, but i also joined vicon at a time of so we say excitement. I think you guys would certainly agree in terms of how virtual production has affected the world, certainly in the context of the pandemic. Um, so it's certainly been a uniquely challenging and rewarding, I hasten to add, uh, experience. Brilliant. Thank you. So yeah, I'm, I'm David Levy. I'm a business development director for Ari Cine Technic. It's a technology company and a manufacturer of camera and lighting solutions. Um, We've spent the last hundred years developing the paintbrushes and canvases to tell stories and that's always been a really big important thing for us. I mean the, the original founders, two best friends who like to make movies together and they saw a need to develop tools to better tell those stories without compromise and to really relay those stories as accurately as possible and to archive them and to replay them and to continuously improve our ability to tell those stories. Um, Prior to Ari, I worked for the Al Jazeera Media Network um, in news and broadcast, which is essentially a, a real-time delivery of content to million people, millions of people around the world. And um, after 11 years with that company, I, I moved to Ari. Um, I have a very good understanding from the cinematic world, but also from the broadcast world. And, you know, the pandemic was a brilliant catalyst for a sort of... Uh, a ramp up of how we use the technology to to tell the stories in um in difficult situations where you know travel and location shooting kind of dried up for seven months overnight we've looked at the environments we'd worked on shows like the mandalorian which were one of the first companies to utilize the technology we've been talking about today and as a manufacturer and a technology company we really wanted to understand it better not only to you know, improve our own internal knowledge on how our tools are being used, but also how to develop the next generation of paintbrushes and canvases for storytellers. Um, 
I've had a really good experience working with Brian from Rebellion, the guys at Vicon. And um, a couple of years ago, I was brought in to a strategic group within the company to explore virtual production in a more detailed way. And what was very evident from the film and episodic television world was everything was siloed. Nobody was talking to each other and they weren't really interested in talking to each other uh, as as much as they are today and so two three years ago i kind of went out and went right what do you guys do what do you guys do how are you you know delivering that so we spoke to epic games we had the they kind of started our journey um, after we worked on the mandalorian supplying hardware we we wanted to explore the area more so we spoke to the guys epic games epic games wanted to build a studio Ari has a small group within the company that specializes in solutions, um, systems integration, power distribution, data networks, suspension systems, camera systems, lighting systems. Predominantly it was for broadcast, but then we realized that actually the games world, the broadcasters, the live events, they all have a piece of the puzzle in order to deliver real-time narrative content to the sort of quality level they expect in high-end episodic television and, and feature film. So our relationship with Epic grew. We built a small stage for them in London, Fitzrovia, their, um, their lab. And then from there, we were also invited by Netflix to build a very large-scale version of that in Babelsberg. It, was, it is one of the largest in Europe. And then in parallel to that, we also built a similar LED volume stage in our offices in Uxbridge, which I had the pleasure to be the project manager on and help design and develop the systems that we would you know, continuously plan to develop forward. So making sure there was extra capacity in all our cable trunking and boring things really. But, you know, really how, how do we go on this journey of technology development with a huge new group of partners um, effectively? And really the, the solution was to build one of our own, a very large full scale size version and um, to not use it only as a R&D lab and a product development sandpit, but also as a fully functional working commercial stage. So last week we had Netflix in to do some um, specific um, parts of their project. Um, we've had people like Coldplay in, we've had um, uh, theater people come in. So we're looking at a much broader area of our industry and we're not just focusing on high-end episodic television and film now, we're concentrating on storytelling from all parts and how, and how we make it easier and more simplified and more integrated. I mean, we've been working with Vicon very closely over the last two years because the studio in Babelsberg required their technology and our technology to really integrate in a much better way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been an amazing journey. And because of this journey, I've, I've had the pleasure to be invited to this panel discussion today to sh share my experiences. Cool. Very good. What would you like from me? Oh, I've just uh, told you everything I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I don't know. Um, what's, what's really exciting about what's happening now? What's exciting? Collaboration. That's the key word for all of it across the industry, whether it's like unis and, and all the way through to Disney or whatever. So like all this tech is really... The, the the whole the virtual production piece virtual production is a very sort of buzzword around the industry right now uh virtual production is a thing where all the things david just said basically is bringing all those different areas together um and and finding a way to make it work and the nice thing about that i think from my side because obviously i come from the sort of this camera tech and tracking and that kind of thing um is we're really integrating properly with really traditional ways of filming or traditional ways of working, things like that. So whereas I, I think, I know some years ago, lots of animators or even um, saw, saw motion capture as like a threat to their job and all that kind of thing, because you always get that kind of stuff with tech. Um, and it's probably, I've seen the same in the film side where we're sort of like, if we go on a location at Pinewood or wherever, we're sort of like, we're alienated in the corner because we, we don't fit with all those traditional nice ways of working in the film industry. Um, and we're those sort of people over there that just do that stuff or whatever. And, and like now with virtual productions especially, is 
everybody has to talk to each other. Everybody has to work together to make it work. Um, and the result is brilliant. Um, so that's the thing that's most exciting about it all, I think. And, and the fact that for, like from the research and the, and the facts, we were talking about costume earlier, I think, um, things like that. The fact that like, like the writers and, and the people sort of producing the films or TV, whatever it is, um, having the resource available to actually sort of do proper research and get the, the story right, basically, and make the story true to what it should be, um, is the, like the start of it all, really. But everybody's involved from day one. That's, that's cool. We've taken a very linear storytelling process, you know, a, a, a three-act um, production, and now we're saying, actually, this can be a much more immersive and transmedia product in the end so we can start off in the video game and we say well you know that video game that'd make a brilliant movie so let's take all those environments and all those characters from the video game we can utilize those same assets in the filmmaking process and then we can take all the models and 3d print them and make the merchandise out of it so there's like really so, so many ways we can we can now utilize this technology to expand on what was a very linear process and we're seeing adoption there are of course people who are frightened by it like um, Brian said, but I think with a new generation of storytellers, there's a real excitement and an opportunity and a democratization of being able to tell stories to such a high quality level. I mean, the Unreal Engine, the, the, um, the world builder you saw there, that's a free piece of software where, who anybody with a reasonable, reasonable, powerful computer can download and, and start building worlds and telling stories and making games and it's it's a very exciting place to be. I mean, we're we're engaged with academia quite a lot as well as ARI. We have our own ARI Academy. We have ARI certified film schools. We're we're currently working on a project with a university in the north of the country where we build one of these LED volumes, and what we want to give to the university along with a very well designed and built and future proof stage for you know the next 10, 15 years, is to develop that skill set within not just the UK, we're, we're hopefully going to be doing this around the world, but you know, we're, I'm here in the UK, so my focus is, is better here, um, to develop the next generation of storytellers and give them the tools and the knowledge from a hundred years of development to, to the modern day. I think uh, Brian's point about the cross collaboration as well, one of the challenges, one of the unique opportunities is how we then communicate that back through the companies we represent. So I might come onto a movie set or and I'll, I'll speak to someone who's using our software and I get their experience and then their input and I have to go back to our development team who've perhaps in some cases been developing this software for 30 years and they know this stuff inside out and suddenly overnight they're getting these demands or these user cases that completely contradict what's been going for 30 years. Like, why would you do these things? And like, I don't know. But then we have to come into the, and it's been a really interesting adventure because that's kind of forcing this explosion. I think part of what we touched on earlier with the pandemic is with virtual production, it's kind of hit the social con uh, conscious relatively recently, but it, it refers to a whole suite of options and tools that go back 20 years in some cases. Green screen kind of is a part of virtual production, but people don't necessarily think of it as such. And I think a lot of these practices or approaches, they've kind of been on the precipice for a long time but no one was really kind of too keen to make, you know, to take the leap and say, you know, we're going to put all our money on, on this. And it really took, I think, a combination of the Mandalorian and the pressure on productions that the pandemic imposed to go, well, now we don't have a choice. So it went from this kind of very sort of gradual gradient effect of people adopting these technologies to, well, now we have to do this stuff. So these conversations had to happen. These integrations had to happen. And from my perspective, trying to, um, trying to disseminate the user need into something that our development team can understand. Taking that context into consideration has been a hugely important part. And what I would implore on anyone who's kind of interested in this world is to try and kind of keep that mentality as you go through these things and, and not be too confined by the expectations of something historically. Obviously respect it, acknowledge it and see how it sits, but know which tools or which elements need to be evolved and who you need to speak to to cultivate those those evolutions. Otherwise, someone else will do it and kind of beat you to it, and you'll be the one kind of you know rushing to chase up. As I think we've all often felt in in some of these cases, is is this the right thing to, to be doing? Is this the right direction to go in? We have no choice because there's there are production needs and we need to to meet them. 
So the studio we built in Babelsberg for this, this um, it's called 1899. It's a German language TV show, which I think is very interesting um, example. I mean, Netflix has done a huge amount for spreading foreign language content to a much broader audience, which I think is culturally and uh, on so many levels very interesting. But that show was meant to be shot on location on a boat all around the world. Pandemic hit that show was going to be scrapped. It would That story would not have been told for another five years or maybe have just been cancelled altogether because, you know, next uh, series of films were, you know, didn't work in the scheduling of, 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 the, of Netflix. But because we had this technology, because we knew we could use it and it had been proven, Netflix took the risk and said, okay, we build it and we shoot 80% of that film inside one location in a studio similar size to this on a boat around the world we designed a, um, a rain simulator in there so real water's coming down but we had to design a clever way of getting the water away from all the technology the led and everything we designed a gigantic turntable which the set actually sat on so the world the the foreground world could rotate in synchronization with the virtual world being played back around it and yeah we we were able to tell a story which would have not been told otherwise. And it's, I always come back to the storytelling part because it's the whole point of why we do this. Fundamentally, as people, we, we want to tell stories and we want to spread ideas and culture, you know, as far and wide as we can. And with huge infrastructure platforms like Netflix, those stories which would have been a kind of niche kind of, if you were only interested in foreign cinema, you would have seen it, but now, the story is told on a huge scale and under what were seemingly impossible conditions. Can I ask a quick question about that? Um, so what you're describing there, it seems like virtual production puts a lot more pressure uh, to create authenticity and to do research. You can't just go out there and film a building or an object, you have to render it. Where do you get the expertise from to do that, to make those things so they, so they look authentic? when you can't get to them or you don't want to use them in a kind of real life version. Well, that's the collaboration part again. And so we're, you know, it's the guys from the games world who their whole job is, I mean, they're slightly cartoonish games, but there are also these really super realistic photo real games. The guys from the VFX houses, your traditional ILMs and your double negatives and your frame stores, that's been their life the last, you know, 20 years. Do you mind years. just explaining for the benefit of those who didn't, don't quite know what all those things are, what you meant by that? virtual effects house who do all the computer generated environments and the game guys they do uh, computer generated environments which can be played back in real time and then of course from our side our ca our cameras have this digital to uh, analog to digital conversion which is about capturing in a quite traditional way on a film camera the world around you in in a photorealistic way so when you you, you're immersed in these worlds, you're immersed in the storytelling because the eye has this very, um, and people have this very um, clever way of, they notice things which aren't quite right. So things like water, very difficult to, to fake. Um, they call it the uncanny valley. There's something not quite right and people just pick up on that instantly. It's the same with faces. So if a computer generated face isn't quite right, we pick up on it. And that's why this technology is very interesting because we can capture all that motion, all those nuances, all that detail, and then the immersive experience becomes, the suspension of disbelief is achieved. And again, part of storytelling is creating that suspension of disbelief. But, sorry, one of, just coming in on that as well. One of the things that I mentioned at the first talk was about the like lack of crew and team and like the education around all those skill sets that you need to be able to drive these systems that's definitely an issue i mean like you guys spoke about it um you know it, it's a it's a real thing you know it's, it's real we have to sort of look at that and and you know just try and help where we can i, I think it comes in i always think it comes in it's not university level it's it's prior to that that's where you need to be yeah. getting involved and and doing things help things you know yeah all that kind of thing workshops whatever it might be just to get youngsters interested in this type of thing secondary school higher education university throughout the entire yeah yeah i think to some extent the barriers have come down a lot on this as well for the longest time I remember when i was looking to study it was 
really a choice if you want to do movies or games because the pipelines and the 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 creation process you will go through th for either was very different and typically because films it was super realistic but you couldn't run it fast it had to be all done offline games we could run in real time but compared to films they don't look great as those two worlds have come close together so too has the technology and the processes that po people go through to to build them what really surprised me when i first stepped onto a, a film set um having done this job was how many game artists were on that set you know people who'd studied game asset creation i wouldn't have thought that they would ever be on the film set before if, you know maybe in the post processing maybe part of of the art development team but there on the day advising the director of photography how to get this effect in the engine and then conveying that back to the the motion capture team what really really hit me was um so tim doubleday was my predecessor he now works for a company called Dimension Studio. I went to visit them on a shoot and uh, I met him and he was my first experience with Viacom because when I was learning the software, he did all the videos and next to him was a student I'd taught 12 months before. So you've kind of got both kind of, you know, sides of, 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 of knowledge, these two extremes in, ter in terms of experience and different backgrounds in this place at once working with photographers and I kind of, or, or, you know, different parts of the of the film crew. And I think... There's this interesting almost symbiosis where the needs of the production has informed this kind of coming together of, the, of these pipelines. But likewise, the coming together of those pipelines has affected what goes on in these productions. It's quite it's been a far more organic process than I think I would have expected just viewing it as an observer. And you talked about storytelling. Has that liaison between uh, game and film changed the nature of the storytelling as well? Oh, this yeah, well, I, I would say so. Absolutely. I mean, I'm a, I'm an avid gamer as well as a popular culture enthusiast, and you know, interactive narrative is exciting for I think a younger generation. But you know, there's also still a place for being taken on a journey, being told a story, sit there in a, again that linear storytelling way. But I think more is expected now because there's more options available. To everyone i mean things like youtube are really interesting because that's something like 90 percent user generated content that's individuals telling their stories and it's instantly available to absolutely everyone and we can't just think in our old sort of ways of well they'll only see it at the cinema and then two years later we'll do a release on dvd and it, it's, it's just not how people like to consume content anymore and i think it's a good thing i think it's improving the you know the intellectual contagions you can spread across the world, um, and maybe contagion is the wrong word, <laughs> not the right. Word, but you, you understand what I what I mean is you. There's more opportunity to, for countries which would have maybe been more isolated to ideas and thoughts and and experiences. It's it's really democratized the way people can consume content. I think also how they create it. Yeah. So, so if, if you think historically, you imagine you go on a film set. You've got this beautiful view and you go, damn, I wish it was six hours later so we could capture the, you know, the sun in a different position. With Unreal Engine 5, you grab the sun and you move it. You know, like, so something that even in CG might have been hours of development just to press the button and wait for it to render is now in real time. And that affects the story because it means the director or the script writer can go, oh, wow, this, now I'm in this, this, this moment. I see it slightly differently and I have the power to iterate the story to, to capitalize on the moment we've just created so the technology is not only liberating consumers but also the creators of the stuff that they're, they're consuming i think it's a cyclical process that benefits everyone absolutely we we shot a thing for with danny boyle in our stage for the sex pistols show that's coming out soon and we were he was having a great time he really enjoyed the technology it was really nice to see a non-technical person embracing the technology but at one point he went ah oh, there was a shot i wanted to get it was night time in a forest, driving down a road. Do you have something like that? And we went, we looked for our database of assets and went, trees aren't indigenous to this story, but you know, what do you think? He's like, shoot it. And we were like, oh my God, like how did that, that, that just would have never happened. That would have been another, that would have been another strain on the budget. That would have been another getting all the crews to find the location and everything. And instantly at the time he went, oh, just, I don't suppose. And he was like, this is brilliant. Let's, let's go for it. Let's, let's give it a punt. And, and this, the idea of being able to hold the sun for 12 hours a day is incredibly efficient and effective. I mean, again, another shoot we just had, it was 
two principal actors. They're the most expensive part of the shooting process. You're Tom Cruise and you're, you're Halle Berry sitting in the car having a couple of pages of dialogue between them. That shoot would have taken two weeks on location in the car and getting all the setups. It was shot in two days inside the control of the stage. It, it was very good. Yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where you can move any mountain. Yeah, yeah. and you if bring you the to mountain it. to Mohammed and yeah. take him yeah, Mohammed to the wanna, mountain. Yeah. yeah, frame the shot however yeah. you want it. So, it's and the nice, choice. but the nice thing as well, you you you, you often think, okay, we're going to get the better shot, but also being able to do something and then just hit delete, like facilitating experimentation, mm -hmm. letting people try something because you don't have the budget or the, the the expense to worry about. Well, is it worth the risk? Because if we don't do this that's part of the budget gone. Well, now it takes five minutes to test that rather than five weeks and, and all the expense that goes with it. And I think, again, empowering people to risk making mistakes because they're not as expensive to make those mistakes as, as they might have been with traditional methods. And things, sorry, I want to say about previous, like I said about just now, the, the sort of the concept of coming up with the idea or developing the idea and pre visiting it before you get your high cost actors and your makeup artists and whatever else, you can actually get to a point where you've got a blueprint, like a, like a storyboard, basically. Um, you've got a digital storyboard that's sort of like you've locked down your camera positions and your framing and how you're going to shoot this story um, before you get the rest of the crew in. So the efficiency there, and like you say, the ability to just try stuff and sort of maybe it would work slightly differently. You know, you'd never think like that before because it would cost you an arm and a leg. So it's, yeah, it just creates a lot more freedom for people to experiment and try and explore new new things, new ways of telling a story. And that pre-visualization that you do in the game engine, it's like a lower render, lower cost version, but that's that's your backbone start to what will be the final asset. And that, mm. that's incredible. So you're starting with a storyboard, that storyboard actually makes it all the way up actually into production. So you're not you're not wasting anything in this process. You're mm. you're you're reversioning and improving throughout the process to get to that moment where you're you're shooting in the stage. I mean, we, we get sent scripts now and we go, you know, because we advise production on how to, to utilize the technology. And instead of scratching out the script going, well, I'm not sending Judy Dench to the Hindu Kush at, in, in the cold of winter, like, you know, minus 40. Oh, it's all right. We can we can shoot it in the stage. We can get Judy Dench. We'll, we'll put the Hindu Kush behind her and she won't be freezing or potentially get shot up or, you know, <laughs> global instability, political instability, location shooting becomes a lot less attractive. And But, you know, you you don't want to limit your storytelling still. You still want to have that scene and the technology is allowing us to, to do that. Mm. And what about your actors? Doesn't Judy Dench ever want to go to the Hindu Kush or Halle Berry to... Well, she might, but her insurance company, <laughs> which, again, insurance companies drive a lot of decision-making these days, don't want that to happen. And of course, everybody likes the Jolly in the Maldives. But if there's a global pandemic and we can't physically get to the Maldives, what do we do? I often think of this like um, as virtual production as being the reason Sir Ian McKellen never needs to cry again. But I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with this, but there was a time when they were shooting The Hobbit and this meme was everywhere. It's just dressed as Gandalf, head in his hands, crying, just surrounded by green. Because he literally said, this isn't why I got into acting to sit on a stage and talk to someone who looks like a giant grape because they're just in the green suit. Um, you know, for one of his, the finest actors of his generation, you could sit, that was soul destroying for someone who has come to own this craft. With an LED wall, the dragon's there, the actors are there, the lighting is there. One of the things that really hit me when we, when we visited your stage and you were talking about, sometimes we'll have an LED wall at the top and a green screen behind because we don't know what the environment is, but we know it's gonna have trees. So we'll, we'll use the tree, we'll have trees on the LED and that sorts the reflections and then we can perfect. Those little things make such a difference to the people in these environments. You don't have to say, imagine a T-Rex. Yeah. And I say this because I've seen the T-Rex, it's awesome. Yeah. They can actually see the T-Rex and I think that has such a visceral impact and it gets people excited to go on set again. I remember a, it was a while ago, a friend was telling me he, he, he went into the film industry and to some extent, he said it, it wasn't that like it crushed his childhood, but I think there's there's... There's an element of seeing how the sausage is made, you know, when, when, you, when you kind of you see what's involved and, and there's, there's a degree of the fantasy that, that goes away. So, you know, it's actually far harder work than I expected as well. Sorry, mate, you know, life is, you know, all the, there's, there's a degree of hard work with all these things. 
and, and you know seeing actors just kind of sit there and wait to get on set whereas now i think there's this palpable sense of excitement that comes from the first time i set on you've got the physical set you've got the led wall and it's just like oh my god this is amazing you know the magic of cinema kind of comes back even on just that visceral level of work and i think that's often we talk about the budget benefits we talk about all these things we can do but for an actor to sell the story, they need to be invested in the story. And that, this, that's this that been facilitated almost just as a byproduct of all these other benefits that I think virtual production's facilitated. It's great stuff. The, the, the actors do love it. I mean, it's little things. So they're driving down the road, they come to a red light. They can see the bends in the road, they can see the red light. And when they hit that red light, it's not like I go, and there's a red light, act like there's a red light. They, they can see it and they just act organically to the to the experience you know they check their phone they look out the window they do all the little nuanced things you do when you stop at a red light and because they can see it and they're not just being cued it's a red light there's no little hesitation or jolt it's a it's a very um natural real. yeah it's real it's a natural experience it's quite theatrical actually and i, I seeing the earlier panel where they were showing the the vna um i was like it's everything we're doing now is actually quite theatrical one, because it's like a real-time performance they're doing in a real-time stage. And we're actually stealing quite a lot of the sort of uh, effects and trickery we used in theatre that we, we used in those early days of film and like Buster Keaton's rolling backgrounds where the back, um, Roman Holiday, where they're on the bike and the, and the background's all moving. We're, we're, we're doing all those tricks, but now we're, we're doing it to a much, much more convincing level, not just for the actors, but for the audience.